This talk is, uh, is about uh, trying to discover why I like BSD system so much. So the, present, the title of the presentation is BSD small but smart. So it's about uh, seeing a uh, comparison between other systems like Linux or Windows and see the benefits, the direct benefits of, of BSD systems because uh, BSD itself is not about the license and the nice demo figure itself. Well, they are both very good, but I think there are many other advantages in these BSD systems in, in general. So that's what I'd like to talk about in this presentation. And uh, so again, what is BSD from this front perspective? So basically, BSD itself uh, is the graphic software distribution. Uh, it's kind of limited as the Unix because derived from ATM Unix, which is widely adopted by Windows by its time that it was used. So technically the Berkeley Unix uh, site of the University of California formed this Unix they started to do research on top of it. And uh, well it became very popular because many uh, companies uh, well spun up from this research and also used the results of this research. And one of the most famous researches uh, in this area was the DCPIP stack because this was um, kind of uh, uh, invention of this BSD distribution. So uh, it became very popular because it will be it is adapted by every system technically that uses networking these days, even Microsoft Windows or Mac OS X or Genus uh, from Juniper. Uh, so BSD is everywhere. You cannot deny it because and of course, these the, the research units uh, provide the basis uh, for open source general It's like previous the the open BSD or general flight. But of course, there, there are many other forms, but these are the major forms that are used uh, and maintained currently. And that's what you can need uh, when you just try to find BSD over the internet. So, this is uh, their current status. But of course, BSD. It's not dying, but living, uh, doing well because it still serves for <coughs> like it still continues to serve as a technological, technological testbed for experiments, doing research uh, in, in the area of operating systems. Like uh, it is used at University of Cambridge, the computer laboratory, especially thanks to Robert Watson, uh, because he does a uh, lot of research based on FreeBSD, like his recent Capsicum. Uh, uh, work or he has a platform Sherry, that also uses BSD. But there is also another project uh, that I was also involved in. It, it is Mirage, that uh, is technically a operating system written of uh, functional language, and uh, there is an ongoing port for FreeBSD. So we are also back to basic to FreeBSD. But of course, there is a research um, in progress at Linux uh, Pisa, the most networking, thanks to the rich so. And uh, there are some other research about networking in Australia at Swinburne University. So you can see that uh, there are academic organizations that uh, use PSD as a as basis for doing their research. And they are doing very good research because they are very famous. And they are also merged back to the, to the source of, of free BSD and other BSDs because they are used in practice. So it's not just like working in the hybrid tower. Uh, isolated from the outside world, but it's something that really works and used, and you can write really good papers on that. But BSD still serves the purpose to be a basis for commercial free products that you can find in many embedded devices used by different companies, like you can meet Finesse nest outside the RCDs that you can take, you can see PFSNs, or you can see that if BSD is developed and used by Delta, EMC, EM, Network, New York Internet, and so on. So many, many companies over Europe and the US and in Japan as well. And of course, the interesting part is that BSD is not completely forgotten because if you just check the NetCraft site, the most reliable hosting sites, you can find three free BSDs out of ten, the most pop, the most reliable sites. And actually, in March, FreeBSD is the first of these most reliable sites. So it's not that at all. It's still used and working very well uh, for uh, hosting, for example. So we can ask the question whether BSD is really about licensing. Well, it has a, a very nice license indeed because allows company to distribute 
that are developed uh, in a proprietary software because PSD science uh, doesn't require you to publish what modifications you do with open source code so we can build the products and make development problems. And it's also very compatible with other licenses because, well, you can turn it into GPL later if you want. So there are no restrictions. The only restriction definitely if I want to simplify the PSD license itself just the main source where you get the sources. I mean, you don't have to publish the modifications, but saying that, okay, I uh, use the sources from there and there. And in, interestingly, the size of the license decreases over time in, in contrary to GPL, because GPL gets longer and longer directions, but the BSD gets shorter and shorter directions. Uh, well, there are different interpretations of freedom, of course. There's a different interpretation of freedom by Q, and there's a different interpretation of freedom by BSD. Well, we respect that. But if you just uh, look under the hood, you will see that there are many other qualities of BSD that you can respect when you choose to use the BSD source. Like, I can say that the general quality of the source code is very high, and you can uh, get a really good source code if you just choose to pick parts of this BSD system and uh, the, also the architecture is very good for pretty good uh, for building products. Uh, this is mostly about or mostly a consequence of uh, having a centralized development of components. So uh, it's, it's a kind of a trademark of BSD system that everything is maintained in the same repository. So the BSD itself is not just a kernel but user land libraries and things like that. And it's very important for for the cohesion. Uh, the components, so it's not it's not something that uh, derives so easily, but maintained together together repeatedly the documentation, so we can find everything uh, uh, in the system working out the box and you can document it. So that's why yeah, the systems also have very good documentation, and uh, uh, it's very easy to, to work with these systems because you just install it and you can just go to the man pages and you will learn everything about the system just by reading the man pages. But of course uh, the systems like the previous DM are also available in HTML format so we can read it the articles of the system so we can read it in a book or read it on a website. Uh, but from the other side and from the software development side it is mostly uh, useful for software developers that the BSD system tries to conform the standards uh, out there. So they try to respect the different standards uh, I list here, which means if you just use a BSD system, you are most sure that uh, they will work with the programs that respect also the same uh, interfaces. But of course, sometimes you can see some conservative like extensions to these standards because sometimes BSDs would like to do more than the standards. Um, expect from an operating system, so they are trying to extend it away that it not break the APIs or the policies. So they, they are retaining the traditions uh, uh, connected to these, to these standards. But um, it also leads to another topic that um, <coughs> they put emphasis on compatibility, stability and reliability of those systems because um, when they are maintaining code they don't want to break different um, interfaces like the kernel programming interface, the application programming interface, or the application binary interface. This latter one is, is not that emphasized these days, but it's very important because you don't have to recompile all your stuff. They will just work when you are updating your system. So let's take previous that's what I know the most. Um, so that's why I'm taking examples from FreeBSD. So if you just update your 8.1 system to 8.4, for example, there won't be any problems because uh, they respect the APIs. Uh, you, you, you can expect some changes if you just move to 9, but of course, changing major versions comes with this price. But if you just stick to the same major revisions, you, you don't have plastic surprises, which, which is good because you can maintain your software without any problems. You can uh, upgrade your system thousands of computers without any problems, which is very good. But it also maintains kind of a binary compatibility layer, which is a uh, um, good tool for, for running Linux programs because it is just another interface for the kernel. So it can, it, it can run many different ELF files 
without any problems because it's just kind of a mapping of certain um, system calls, so it can work almost out of the box. And sometimes it's, it's, it's much faster than running on the top of which is kind of, kind of interesting. And of course, uh, all of these things are a consequence of, um, of the major development model because the previous the uh, using the centralized development of components consider the workflow, the given workflow of all these components are developed. So uh, usually they have had branch or a new branch then where everything can happen, but usually it is also kept very stable so people can also just track the development branch, but nothing guaranteed, so it's not recommended for production systems. But there's also another branch called stable where you can see the well, the tested changes that you can track without any problems uh, because they are trying to maintain the, this compatibility stability in their uh, requirements but also all can be used for, for having uh, this new stuff um, uh, before the, one of the releases published that contain these um, components. So this, this development model has also plays well with these qualities because uh, you can only uh, merge um, these changes back to the stable branch uh, once it, it, it received uh, enough testing. So it is nature enough or yeah, at least uh, tested enough to be uh, ready to be available for, for clients and it, it, uh, and it is uh, ported to the, to the given interfaces to respect uh, them. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, but you can also say, uh, see some changes recently in BSD system that you can take as a, a time to revise some things in, in the base system. But most of the time it's not really about revising some things. Once it has, its, it has this consequence, you can say that uh, if you change the license, uh, it is easier to manage. You, you get the, the BSD. Uh, benefits of licensing like, like you can use in any product. But let's just take some simple case studies like the Clan Gallery and change. It's not exactly about the license, but about changing the approach to using the profile itself because LLVM is, is, is more uh, library based approach than, uh, than GCC. At least it works better um, in this environment. So uh, it's more flexible. So you can embed um, LLVM even into the kernel without any problems. But you cannot use it as a base compiler or a force compiler and things like that. So uh, it's, it's improved to be more flexible than you see. Uh, but there's also the BS license grab. It also takes the same approach. It tries to create a tool that has a library uh, in the background. The, the grab itself is just, just a front end of this library. So uh, it's, it's not mostly about the license itself. So, we as the developers in general are trying to uh, satisfy the needs for simplicity, usability, minimalism, quality, trying to avoid X. So sometimes they just rethink the problems and uh, it, it is not about licensing itself. Because if you find some uh, open source code on the internet, some random code, well, it's not guaranteed to be good. You have to, well, have to see it have to review it, have to test it, have to merge it to your project. <coughs> so that's what developers mostly are mostly doing when they are developing the BSD system. They are trying to uh, kind of um, maintain security for source code. So if they find something that doesn't work well, they just decide to rewrite it. Uh, because they are professionals of their field and uh, they can do it without any problems. Or, or of course they can uh, seek for professional advice by doing some reviews uh, for each other or uh, discuss the problems and they find a solution together. And of course keeps uh, things are keep changing so sometimes it's, it's, it's not good to stick to the old things, uh, maintain the old old stuff. Uh, just take a deep breath and rewrite everything from scratch. Because um, there are changes in the hardware, there are changes in the software environment, there are changes in the trends. So sometimes it's you don't have other choice, just rewrite everything from scratch. And this means there's a lot of room for improvement, but it doesn't mean, of course, it worked also well, but it's another attempt to try to 
well, approach things from a different side, try to approach it from another side, not only just copying blindly from Linux to another operating system, just try to experiment with these things. So they are just taking the challenge of, of uh, innovation. So you can see that there are many technologies developed uh, use BSD systems or maintain BSD. Uh, so I don't see it's a problem. So it's not a threat to GPL, not a threat to Linux, but it's another new mindset, another way of thinking about things. So and it has a nice results that you can see that work well and use well, uh, even in commercial environments. But as I presented you, they are also using academia and so objectively. Uh, so the PSD community in general can say it's very open to to new ideas and they like to experiment so they are finding their own solutions to problems. So uh, you should also see that BSD is not that well I wouldn't say that high but uh, it's not that supportive as other systems. So it has scarce resources like with all of its well consequences. So yeah, in general I would say that BSD systems have to uh, be more careful of developing their resources because uh, they don't have the property, they don't have the of the developers, uh, but only a few very dedicated people who are uh, really want to do something with the system. So they are uh, also not necessary skills and experience or gain by developing the systems because um, the measure developing the world that I've heard before uh, also includes some mentoring, this kind of teaching, um, teaching programmers how to program in a production environment, how to do it better. Than they would do, for example, after uh, simple academic uh, education. So they become very experienced, skilled, and mature, and of course they are trying to work together, so it's very common because, because they don't have other choice. They cannot say that, okay, it's something that works. I just hire a few hundred programmers to solve this program for me. They cannot do that because it's a voluntary project, so everybody does it for fun, does it for, uh, for prestige, does it for for this company, it depends. It depends on the personal motivations. Uh, so that's why it's important to be careful with the investments for projects because we cannot allocate resources for everything. So we can we can do that because let's see in Linux you have system D that boots the system quickly in a few seconds. But in PSD it's not a priority, but it's not a problem because the system still boots. Maybe in minutes, but it's boots and girls. So everything is fine. But if there's a developer that finds it's a very interesting challenge, well, he's free to rewrite it if you can do that. But it's not a priority for the PSD, it's not a problem. And you can also see that because PSDs have less members, usually the number of teams is, is lesser, so they are more manageable. Less, uh, uh, there's less overhead in communication and management, that means it's easier to, to make the changes it's also make, make progress. Uh, so it has its own advantages. But of course, it also has the advantage that this uh, work is usually focused. That means uh, the, the, there's a common goal that everyone wants to chase, and the goal is to, to have things done uh, as soon as possible, not to, to buy sheds. These, uh, these uh, endless debates about very trivial things. So that's what the developers are trying to avoid because nobody really needs them. They want to go ahead and do things and, and make progress. So that's why it's very common in the BSD community and that's why I like it very much, especially because the conversation tends to be polite. They are they maintaining the friendly tone of discussion. They are they have uh, uh, mostly technical uh, reasons about things. So they are not reasoning by person. They are reasoning by, by, by uh, uh, technical uh, problems or they are trying to propose uh, another ways of solving things but without, without doing great debate, debates about that. So these te technical discussions are mostly constructive. They are trying to find a way to head, not backward. And of course, uh, I also mentioned that it's very important in these uh, communities that uh, these changes usually have been to be used, which is also very common in academia, because um, you know that you have good paper, you have good reviewers, you can, you, uh, can give you uh, comments on your work, you can tell you what to improve, what to improve it. 
So this is also a way of learning things. And it's, it's very common in, in BSD systems because, for example, in OpenBSD, as far as I know, uh, every change has to be okay by the developer. That means the review, but not, uh, not just uh, doing things uh, randomly, but, but uh, uh, communicating with each, with each other, which is part of the caution. Let's see uh, the numbers. So we can ask the question whether BSD is lagging behind. You know, so do those. Well, let's check the numbers. How many developers are available uh, for the systems? Uh, I got these numbers from different sources, but, well, I think they are mostly correct. So for the Linux kernel, the kernel itself, it has 1,300 developers, which is pretty much for a kernel. Compared to, for example, FreeBSD, we have 50, maybe. Uh, and there's Debian that has package maintainers, you mean package builders, more than 1,000. I mean, three years we have 100, maybe. Mm. So all the num number of the three years developers is about 360. But you can see the number of Debian developers is, is around 240. And at the end, uh, just count the, the number so of you're talking about the meters. Sorry? You're talking about the meters here? Yes, yes. Of course, uh, Developers are not doing the committers only. The uh, guys who are sending patches, so that's why I try to accommodate in these numbers. So uh, at the end, you can see the OpenBSD is 120. So it's, it's pretty small communities. But they are, they are doing very well because they can keep up with these changes done in years. For some reason, they, are, they can do that. Yeah, I was thinking about that, that generally. Uh, given the number of people that we have, uh, we're doing pretty well. That yes, doesn't yes. mean that. Yes. Know. So compared to numbers and quality, we are really good. I think. And of course, um, it's also possible because these projects also try to communicate and uh, pick changes from each other. So, for example, uh, there's PF, which is also available in FreeBSD and using PF sense. So PF sense is mostly taken as a, as a fork of FreeBSD, but Everybody knows that PF is from OpenBSD, so we just adapt most of the sources and start to maintain a non for of it. So, but it, it's, it's okay because there are things that OpenBSD developers also take from FreeBSD, like the Intel DRAM uh, uh, support for Intel cards. It also comes from FreeBSD because FreeBSD was the first system that uh, managed to make uh, this functionality to the Linux drivers. So, they can see that, of course, it's not everything being played here, but, but well, two from the systems with, with some desire for quality, so kind of monitoring for, uh, for finding good code, import it or fix it up or change it to that easy. But still, still nice numbers. <laughs>